joining us today on this wonderful Wednesday evening uh, from Nightfall, uh, Harry Potter and the Royals, if I'm not mistaken as well, Genevieve Gaunt. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. How are you doing today? I'm very well. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, we've had a nice little preamble, little chat. Good old chat, getting yeah. everything. I know it's like a warm up, really, isn't it? Okay. Um, so you've been in the industry for quite a long time now, haven't you? Would you say 10, 12 years? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, my, my, my big break really encapsulated like everything that the acting industry is about. Uh, an actress dropped out. I had to like man up, get on that stage. And I, you know, my performance was Goldilocks and the Three Bears when I was three. Really, just it—it uh, it was everything. Like I've I've heard, uh, heard some. I read the reviews yeah. of yeah. beautiful. It's things. gone down in 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 history actually um, among especially among like you know primary schools and they put, blue, they put a blue black on the wall outside. To, to oh, definitely, uh, it was yeah. it was Battersea Park. Yeah. It was probably nineteen ninety four. I was, um, I was three. God. You know, the the girl before me got stage fright, and I was like, I just went for it. I've got to do it. Yeah, I've got to uh, it was fortify myself yeah. and get on there. It was actually, it was, it was apparently moving, and uh, and funny. So really, it was that was my first job. Yeah, so I'm just kicking Rylan- myself now. I, I heard Mark Rylance said something. Actually, though. he nearly quit when, Did he, he? when he saw my performance. Yeah, he wow. was like, "This is a lot. Yeah. This is too much. I'm, I'm actually not. It's not even the same kind of ball yeah. game yeah. anymore." Baby Bear. I mean, it's it's it's, it's one of the great roles. Mark, if you're watching, mate, I'm very sorry. This is a joke, and uh, we'd like to have any uh, love you. disclaimer yeah. here. Disclaimer please, here. please, like, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing, Mark. You're doing very well. Like a headline is being pushed out there right now. But um, so you you have been in the industry for a very yeah, long time. Yeah. So I mean, my parents were actors, mm-hmm. and um, I, I mean, my first real job was doing a short film when I was 11, and then the casting directors for Gina J, who's amazing. Uh, she came round to my school, and um, they asked for kids with sticky out ears or something. Um, so yeah, and I didn't really fit the, the the brief. I wasn't the right age or something. And I remember just going anyway and kind of talking my way in there, saying I'd done this short film. And they saw me, and then there were thousands of kids, and we kind of got through those rounds. And that was my first major professional job, age twelve. And then uh, I went to I went to university. Um, I remember when we were talking about coming on the show and you said um, having parents in the industry, did that prepare you in any particular way? I think it did. I think they were, my mum My mum brought me up really and she was very realistic about how difficult it is to have a career and actually make a living and be fulfilled as an actor. So she said, um, try and go to university if you can. But I did loads of drama when I was there. And do, do you feel that going to university has helped you? Uh, on this journey i think maybe you can go to drama school university you know whatever i think having life experience in some way and like making making friends Mm -hmm. and you know that kind of stuff is is important but i did i have having done like a bit of harry potter or whatever when you're a a kid it's not the same as like getting on stage and working Mm. in a team and like doing rehearsals you know that's that's really what acting is about and i think that i went to university and did loads of plays there and that's where I decided for myself if if I could do it, if I wanted to do it, and if I could maybe have a career. Yeah, of course. And, you know, when people go to university, generally it's sort of 18, 19, 20. That's quite early to know what you want to do. Even, you know, people change careers all the time, but, that you know, that's quite a big ask. So I think it's probably, you know, I think you did the right thing by, uh, you know, doing that and getting on stage and, and working and discovering that. Even though, you know, obviously you touched on it with other films and what have you earlier on. Um, did... At a young age, was that something your parents dissuaded you from doing, do you think? Especially being in the industry themselves. Yeah. Um, I think that what was nice was that it, in a way you could say it found me and something about, something in me found it. Um, sometimes people say, why did you become an actor or like whatever? And I, I kind of want to say, well, we're just damaged. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the one where we are sat at home crying like who at hurt, the end of the day. Who hurt yeah, you? <laughs> what, I just what? want to hurt myself. Yeah, mas- exactly. Every yeah, all the time. I yeah. want to put myself out there. And you have those moments where you're just thinking, God, what am I doing with my life? And God, this got really dark really quickly. <laughs> guys. Um, but yeah. I, d- I didn't start this. I didn't start <laughs> this. This is you two. No, Oliver is so full of just like <laughs> self belief <laughs> on all this kind of thing. I'm fine. He's fine. He's fine. No, He's fine. I think that. I think that once you w- once you're in the industry for a few years, you kind of decide whether or not 
every job has its ups and downs. Every job has its kind of type of pain. Mm -hmm. And I think that whatever the the painful bits of acting are, it it's worth it and I love it. Has there been anything that you've done personally then that one of these pains or something that you've really learned from that has really pushed you in a way yeah definitely and i think i think boundaries are important um so i remember going off to do a couple of screen tests for european projects and getting there and having said i wouldn't do nudity them kind of saying well you know you you know you should because you have a lovely body and, and being you know 20 and thinking that's just not right and sometimes if it seems too good to be true it probably is mm -hmm. So there are all these kind of things that, that you learn, um, but I kind of you kind of roll with the punches, and I would rather do that, uh, have you know, not knowing necessarily what you're doing next week or whatever, than have a kind of nine to five job. And how have you? How do you think it's shaped you in the sense of because when you you know you've done a lot of great work, but people forget that in between that there's a lot of rejection. You know, you're going for things constantly. Yeah. How do you think? How have you dealt with that personally? I think I mean because it's very rare that an actor has a you know starts off and then bam it's the rest of their life they're working all the time and and not received any any sort of fallbacks or anything that's true i mean i do a lot of voiceover work um audio dramas and like commercial stuff so that's great because it is still a challenge i it's kind of creative you get material like you know on the day and you have to kind of you know go for it and that keeps me that keeps my brain going and i find it fun and it's you know it's it's good money i mean I also tutored. I tutored English. I went to uni, so I I do that on the side as well, which is which is fun. And um, you studied English at university. Yeah, because yeah. I already speak it, so I was like, "This is nailed it, nailed it." it. Yeah, I, I know. Exactly what I'm doing. She just came back for three years and just did plays. <laughs> no, it was great. People know my secret. <laughs> well, I'd always find that whenever I'd hear people, this is a side topic, but um, when you know French people would go to university and they study French or something, I was like, "That's cheating, surely? Come on, you know the language already." <laughs> well, actually. You know, when I was 12, I remember an actor on Harry Potter who thought that, I thought, um, to be honest, I probably thought the same thing at 12, that uh, if you uh, speak with a French accent, that you are actually speaking French, <laughs> and that people, you know, you are automatically, you know, uh, uh, fluent. Say, yeah, I know. Exactly what you I know, mean. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I find if you do speak like this to French people, that they actually un maybe understand you better. So mm. it's, it's good, yeah. They don't think you're a little bit, I don't know, racist or something like yeah, that. Probably probably yeah, probably. Yeah, especially after a project, yeah. people not fighting. <laughs> no. Not a good idea. <laughs> um, y you mentioned Harry Potter back just then. You d Was that the one just before you mentioning you got called in at 12 years old, they come and asked for? Uh, how did that kind of audition process uh work was it just like a one day thing and they said yeah you're great we'd like you on what was it like being on set at that young age and there were several rounds of auditions so i mean thousands of like of that of us i mean maybe maybe four rounds where they'd get you to do scenes and they'd observe you and then they whittled it down to maybe five girls going up for the same part we went to leaves and studios and that's when i was in a room with Alfonso Cuaron, and he directed me. And I remember, I remember improving. And he, he he asked me if I had a pet as my character. My character is a Slytherin mm. bitch. Bitches <laughs> are the best. Um, and I said I'd have a vampire back called Vamp. And the coolest thing ever was that because they you know had this extraordinary like creativity and, and budget and they held a whole menagerie actually that they i was taken to the menagerie and was given a fruit bat um as my character i mean scenes get get cut and stuff i was about to say i don't remember that it scene was just a prop it, re it was really just used as a, as a as a kind of prop okay. an animal prop but that was really cool you weren't we terrified of having a bat? No, it was you? a fruit bat. It's adorable. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going like this with my fingers, um, rubbing my fingers together because I remember so vividly being given a little piece of mushy banana and eating it off my finger. You see the videos on YouTube. <laughs> just like, oh my God, this is two hours of my life disappearing <laughs> right now. That kind of thing. Yeah, we do that though, right? Yeah. We have like the keys to the world and like all of knowledge at our fingertips with our phones and, and we it goes use it to, to watch like cat videos. Dogs, cats. Yeah. Fruit exactly. Batch, yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. yeah, priorities. Yeah. Exactly. Was Harry Potter something you were a massive fan of? 
Because I was a huge fan of the book. Because we remember the time yeah. before Harry Potter. I remember when Harry Potter hit the world yeah. and the phenomenon that it is. Yeah. So it must have been a massive thing for you at that age, especially to to, to get cast in that. Yeah, d- I'm a huge fan of the books, and and I've I've met uh, J.K. Rowling kind of more recently because I did a a job called The Cuckoo's Calling. Uh, which she, sh- they're her books. She writes under that's the pseudonym right. Robert was Galbraith. That the, yeah, that's right. And then someone found out yeah. that was her. But I love those books as well. So it's kind of, it's. I think that is magical when mm. stuff that you like is adapted and then you somehow get to be part of that world. Yeah. That's great. And when, how long ago did you do that? What, the Cuckoo's mm. Call? Mm. I think it's 2017. Was that the detective thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's thing. right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you keep in contact with anybody from Harry Potter? Or um, Harry Melling, um, Alfie Eno, but people I kind of, We'll bump into. Mm-hmm. Lovely. Mm-hmm. Lovely guys. Lovely that was so long. Absolutely what was it, 2004? Lovely. It was a long, it's a long time, time ago. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time How ago. How old were you when you did that? 12. Wow. 13. That's really young to, to be on on set. And was that the fir- the biggest job you'd had at that? I mean, obviously, you'd, it was the biggest job you'd had at that age. Oh, what do you mean? I'd done a, sh- a short film yeah. before <laughs> that. Yeah. And she'd been the baby bear as well. <laughs> so, I mean. I yeah, we've know. talked about this. Yeah. yeah, yeah do you remember yeah, the yeah, baby yeah, one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come go, back. Go with it. <laughs> Ollie's left, finally. <laughs> oh, God. Um, how have you found <laughs> the difference between something like Harry Potter and, I don't know, Nightfall or The Royals or something? Is it very similar? I realise that Nightfall and The Royals are TV, but Harry Potter is a, a series of films. Mm-hmm. Would you find that there's a lot of similarities between all of them or there's different structures to it, how it plays out? Um I don't know, because Harry Potter's like a set story. It's already written. We know the story. Whereas TV shows... That's a really good point. So on the Royals and and in some way on Nightfall 2, they, the writer's room, they, they write as they go along. They kind of know where they're going, but I think they also want to see the chemistry between actors and see how things go, mm-hmm. um, which is definitely exciting, um, especially if you kind of get on well with the writers and they get to know you. I, I really feel that like you're... It it does it does grow and change as you go along hmm. in that story. Is um, TV something you prefer doing, like in that way, like it's ep- episodic rather than a single film? Yeah, people say like, "What's your favorite genre?" I say employment. Yeah, oh. because TV has changed Deep. now. TV is Deep. like film, but it's continuous. Like Game of Thrones now is like you know anything like that. You know what? That is something that the quality of stuff that we watch is is so insanely high that I think. It's it's amazing and it's wonderful, but I think it does stress people out even more on set because because directors are now like you know every every director feels like they have to be Roger Deakins mm. and the stuff they create is stunning. So I feel like sometimes maybe we don't get enough direction or there's not enough time to like go over and do takes and stuff again because it does move at such a fast pace. But then that, that's cool too because mm. so something like Nightfall, how long would an episode be? Something like what two weeks to film? Like the actual acting side of it? Yeah, about yeah. two weeks. I mean, yeah. the Royals would have a really quick turnaround. Maybe like a week to ten days an episode. And if you've got, I don't know how long the crown shoots, or but something that's, you know, um, probably got a longer shoot time, maybe like three weeks is, is, is the maximum. It depends how ambitious it is. Would that be because something like Nightfall had a lot of, I don't know, sword fights and battle scenes and all that kind of thing? Or would it be simply because that's just how long they decided they need to give you what the the shoot time for an episode yeah so you said so the royals are slightly shorter than something like nightfall oh yeah because i mean the royals is all basically a lot of interior a lot of walking and talking Mm. some complicated stuff but not quite the same we you know we had horses sword fighting Mm. it's more Um, cinematic sort of production value to to that yeah definitely Mm. yeah um yeah on that on that note i one that one you know we were talking about the ups and downs of acting. I mean, I was in Prague for four months and I was like doing horse training every day and I got to um, do some falconry as well. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and they, they, they taught you that on, so well, obviously not on set, but just... What do you mean, you, what you don't know falconry? Yeah, I know. It's um, There's a, there's a guy who does it. It's in my spotlight now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> highly skilled. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> next to oh, yeah. Can we just all be honest about this a second? Yeah. How many highly skilled things do we say we can... I think anything that I have spent more than two weeks doing, I've then decided I'm highly skilled at. Yeah. Uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd really hate to look back at it and go. Well, so we, we probably all think we're highly skilled at walking and talking at the same time until you have to go up for like yeah, a, a chocolate right. commercial. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right? <laughs> and then you find that your arms are like, how, how do my yeah, arms yeah, exactly, move when yeah. I walk? Do yeah. they go this high? And you're yeah. just like, no, no, just walk normally. And yeah. <laughs> never, never ever walk. What's normal anymore? Yeah, exactly. So going on through the years, what, what do you think has been, um, when you started to see the things that were coming in for you that you were going for, when did you start to see that change? Was that because of things that you'd done or your age and your casting type slightly changed? Uh, how, how did you see that? Uh, sort of journey going i think the biggest change we've all felt is self-tapes mm-hmm. i think that's changed a lot i don't know how you guys feel about self-tapes but i kind of think they're a bit of a paradox because ignorance is bliss like you go into a meeting and you have no idea what it looked like and sometimes i mean what i would say is that when you do do it at home and your mate puts you on tape and you get to see it back it's a bit like oh my god i can't believe um, I'm doing this or that, but the tiniest. I mean, you're si- when you set up this equipment, you know, as you know, like where you put the camera or like where you put the light or these tiny things. Or I mean, maybe um, I don't know, just the angle of your 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 head, or you've got a bit of the door in the way, or the the opening your opening delivery of a line. You know, y- there's so many things that you can your pace. There are so many little things that you can change that actually they do make a difference. Mm. They make a huge difference, mm. I think. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. But then if you're with a great casting director, uh, like Suzanne Smith or, or, or Robert Stern, or you know these, these great casting directors who know what they're doing and they, can, they do direct you. Well, that's why they're called casting directors, mm. isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you kind of, so when I auditioned for Nightfall, Suzanne Smith is, I adore, um, and she... She had me in for Nightfall and she often will do one or two takes because she knows that that's probably, it's a look Mm. and, you know, that your first take is probably... The most you. The most you. Mm. And, and, I mean, but then she's very insightful and will will adjust stuff if if, if necessary. But... um, How many rounds for that? Like a TV series, (laughs) would it be three or four auditions for that as well? Because didn't you take over from someone else? Um, So my... I played... um, Princess Isabel. Princess, thank you for reminding me. Thank I you. Did my research. Thank you. It's good. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> like a teleprompter. Yeah, it's yeah. Good. It's <laughs> just good. got it like that writing up here. Oh, thank you, yeah. Siri. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know what? You'd, be, you'd you. be a nice voice for Siri or Alexa. Hi there. Going left. You say that now. Yeah. You say that now. <laughs> like you've been here yeah. twenty minutes. <laughs> like you wait. <laughs> yeah. No, I just get a bit excitable at times. It's all right. Uh, well, this is yeah. the other mad thing about this business. I getting a like a lead in Nightfall. It was the easiest audition process ever. I had w- two small scenes that weren't even the finished final. They were just mocked up for mm. the sake of the auditions. They were oh, so they never turned up in what you were filming. They did in some form. Oh, okay, but they weren't. They weren't very long, meaty scenes. They were quite. They were. They were pithy, but they weren't. You know, it wasn't a long, heavyweight scene, and. Um, we did it and 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 two weeks later i got the job but i think that's because the americans they actually they knew who i was and they they knew my work i'd seen before i think the showrunner um had seen my stuff and kind of wanted me so that's where that's where like it swings and roundabouts you know sometimes you can't compete against Hmm. an actor because they they they're wanted for whatever reason and in in this case it worked in my favor so it was more just a little bit of a test really they wanted to see you do because they were probably were settled on you already, I imagine. And it was one of those where they had to convince a producer or two, or I don't know. I guess so, but I mean, the Royals was the same. I just, I, we just vibed really well. I just used that, just dropped the vibe word. Um, who, who am I? <laughs> who am I anymore? I don't know. I need to have give myself a talking to after this. <laughs> I was like, like vibing. I was like, great. I was like, oh my god, it, it was, was so funny. It was amazing. <laughs> Have you ever thought about going to LA and working there or living there? Like when I said, like, it's amazing. And you that's were like, what that's LA. what prompted my question. Oh, my God. <laughs> I would love to. She'd smash it out there. I would love to. I think. It's so great. I can see it already. People are so beautiful. Here we go. Another one of these sort of, like, I need an exorcist in here or something. <laughs> like, I don't know what's <laughs> going on. Charlie. <laughs> um, it's been French. It's been LA. Yeah. What next? When I go to LA, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think these places where the industry is so much, uh, like, the heart, of um do you want my water? No, yes, yours. No, yeah, <laughs> <mine>. <laughs> take walk, well, take it, Thank take you it. Thank you so much. I think I'm glad you interrupted you that for something important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't like uh, there was a fire or something yeah. going Actually, on. Actually on that note on that note, the the worst the w- the weirdest thing 
that happened to me in an, in an audition once was that a casting director, not naming names, did... We'll have a flash up here of what, who it yeah. is. <laughs> did... Like a subtitle at the bottom. Take the water and just pour <laughs> the longest drink <laughs> during a take. eye contact. During, so yeah, 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 she did. <laughs> like, as if maybe I couldn't <laughs> see <laughs> or, like, notice. It was off-putting, but but we did it. Um, did, you did you book the job? Uh... I think it was pilot season, okay. so if, if you believe that you'll get everything you mm. got from pilot season, then you're insane. I've got a bridge insane. to sell you, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, we interrupted um, your question. So, yeah, I think LA, it's such a hub for, obviously, for the industry. I think if you're working there, that's amazing. I'm, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, London, London is my home, so I think that you've got to feel at home somewhere. And I think if you're working in a place and you've got friends there, then great. Mm. But, yeah. Fair enough. And if uh, anyone was watching now who's younger and was in the position that you were like at university and considering it, maybe done a little about acting or no acting, what sort of advice would you give to them? It's really hard to say. I think I think you've got to like with anything in anything in life, really think why you're doing it. Do you want to be famous? Like, do you want to make money? That's a bit like going into tennis because you want to be famous or make money it's like the odds are you know is that not why you play tennis <laughs> guys no terrible joke sorry <laughs> 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 I, don't know, yeah, I don't know why I bother even inviting you on here oh, I'm sorry I interrupted you joking. Joking. no no I just I think that you've really got to love it mm. you've got to love it do you think a lot of people now in your opinion you can be, you can lie here or you can be honest um, oh. do you think most people do do it because of fame the desire for it a little bit. I'm thinking there's probably a little bit in in everyone to a degree, but because um, I was talking to someone quite a few people recently, and they didn't know who like Stanley Kubrick was. I was talking to them. I'm like, who's Stanley Kubrick? <laughs> right, no. right. This is over. <laughs> this is over, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, this week we though, have. Uh, <laughs> we'll just get someone in from outside yeah. and we'll just chat to them. No, no but, um, actually, he's one of the he's one of the dudes that like you watch and you. It reminds you why why you. Do yeah, this. that's right. And I was talking to them, and they were like, "Who's Stanley Kubrick?" I'm like. How have you avoided this? This yeah. is like a footballer not knowing who David Beckham is. Yeah. It's like, ha have you been just sh like taken and like sheltered for your whole life? You can't yeah. really avoid it if you just yeah. watch anything. And they don't know. They don't have like a passion for film. And they and you talk to them about something and they just haven't seen it. And that's, you know, that's not wrong. But it does make you wonder why. Like, what are you here for? Just to do some acting. Like, really? There is a degree of that. But do you not love film? Do you not love, you know, maybe they're more a theatre person. But still, it does make you wonder. And it's something that, I probably think too much about, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Kubrick's a good example. He was a he was an obsessive uh, from a young age, like just taking photographs. Like, what is that when you're a kid? Like, you're just you know you just go for it. I don't know. But you also hear about that when on the set of The Shining, where he would obsessively push people further and further and further to get. Yeah, wanted. yeah. I mean, he's um. Have you seen Film Worker? Which is no, but um, I've seen the documentary that his his daughter made of the making mm. of The Shining. But things like he, his, his technical, th he was so revolutionary technically. You know, he invented, he he and his DOP invented the Steadicam on the Shining. It, yeah, it was used on there at first, wasn't yeah, it? Because yeah, because they... And certain lenses and stuff that he, he used. Because of that claustrophobic atmosphere, they didn't take, as people will probably know who are listening to this if in the industry, is that y if, you have, if you build a hotel, you'll have walls that you can take out on mm. a TV set so, or, or a film so that you it can... It was Elstree, wasn't it? Was, was it Elstree? Elstree? Yeah, but the, the external shots are in Colorado, I think. Or Damn, I tried way. to find Every that hotel on TripAdvisor. <laughs> 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 She's like employed a team of people yeah. to go and find it yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all, all his films. For the pretty worst much. holiday yeah. of your life. That kind of thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, everything, yeah, it was all at Elstree, Elstree Studios. And um, anyway, I interrupt you. Yeah, Steadicam. No, yeah, the Steadicam he invented, uh, all the natural light on Barry Lyndon. Mm. Uh, the use of the candles he designed yeah, specific candles to burn like slow or brighter or something so we could use that and what? And, a, and eyes wide shut he said it at Christmas so he could use Christmas lights to like we need we need some light in here well let's stick some Christmas trees in here let's yeah. get some more lights and things like that he all thought about that and that's why I'm a, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to it and I went to his exhibition like three or four times when it was oh there oh yeah okay and um, you know they were starting to get worried they thought I was like a, uh, a thief or something or like I was going to do a bombing there they kept like looking at me every okay, time I went in. yeah it's <laughs> like yeah I'm still here it's like currently single yeah but um, <laughs> yeah and uh, I was I think it was on Barry Lyndon so the guy who played not his son but I think it was the stepson 
He then went on to work for Kubrick as his assistant. He's in Eyes Wide Shut as well as the guy, the masked guy. Oh. I forget his name. Can you look that up? Can yes. you type in film worker? And film worker is a documentary on not, it. You're not talking about Dominic Savage. No, no, no. Dominic no. Savage is a friend of mine. He's an amazing director. He did those yeah, I Am I know. Isn't films. He, yeah, he, was, he, he, was, he yeah, was young. That's right. um, yeah, Bullingdon. Yeah, yeah. Bullingdon. He okay. was young Bullingdon. Um, you're thinking of... Um, oh my god! What's Le- Leo, uh, Leon, Leon Vitelli. Yes, Leon Vitelli. And he said his daughter spoke on there, or his son, and said, "I used to come downstairs in the morning and find my dad curled up on the doormat because he knew if he if he overslept, like he'd sleep for like two hours and then get up and he'd have like the phone next to him and things like that. So when Stanley called, he'd be there. And it's just like crazy. I mean, it is crazy. It yeah. was crazy. He like de- um, dedicated his life. There he is, Leon Vitelli, mm. and he literally gave up being an actor. Like he had quite a successful career to go and work for him. Yeah, and um. Anyway, what, what in some what way we, we were talking, we got onto this because we were talking about this fame genius director, but also maybe um, shouting at people and being nasty to get good performances out. I think an extreme example like Kubrick is difficult because although stories of the way he behaved, certainly <laughs> um, the actress on The Shining, I think he really shattered her confidence. Mm-hmm. That's not cool. I mean, would we all like to be? Um, bullied a little bit as actors to get a performance like that. Oh yeah, I, th- yeah, I think all yeah. of us are happy. Yeah, we'll be that. like, oh, let me just like lie down on the road mm. and you can like drive over me. Have you had that? Have you ever been not? But that that's the thing. In my experience, like, you know, a bit of tension on set or in a rehearsal room is good. Like, if everyone's like too happy, maybe that doesn't feel good either. But to be honest, I think it's about trust. You know, and if you if you can trust the people you're working with, you can try ideas out. I think if you're frightened, if you can use your fear, then great. But a lot of the time it just freezes you up. So, I don't know. If a director pushes you because they know they can get something out of you, then then great. I've had both. I've had both. Especially on TV jobs because you've got different directors doing different episodes. Mm-hmm. Any big like examples of a time where... Well, you've got... I've had directors who aren't very hands-on mm. in terms of like directing and they, they just let you do your thing and they think you're great. So they've been more involved in like the technical aspect and like let yeah, the actors or kind of... Or, or they just they just like what you're doing and then that gives you confidence and mm. when you get confidence, you relax. And then you've got directors who will say, you're doing too much on that line or not enough on this or can you speed this up or whatever. And in a way, that's also nice because you they can command respect and also you feel like you you're not completely at sea. So it really, it really is swings and roundabouts. And then you, yeah, and then you see it back. And, and that's also fascinating, seeing all the, the choices that directors make. Um, but yeah. But going back to how we originally got into this about knowledge and people, the, the desire for fame and profit, do you think that's something you would dissuade people from, <laughs> you would dissuade people from uh, pursuing it if they if that's what their sole desire was and sometimes i think people lie to themselves sometimes like i know some people and it's like you just know that they want to be famous you can just see it in them they don't know i could talk to them about film and they wouldn't know i, I th- what else like there was kubrick and someone else i mentioned and they just didn't know who it was and i'm like I, I, uh some ben kingsley i was talking to them and they were like, oh there's a film called um so and so no 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 he was auditioning for it and he's oh. got, got some guy called ben knightley in it and i was like do you mean Ben Kingsley? He was like, yeah, Sir Ben Kingsley. He's like, yeah, yeah, who's that? And I'm like, okay, thanks very much. Don't talk to me again. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. But um, The other and thing, I though, is that, like, music, right? People go into music because it moves you, ultimately. And even though maybe we don't necessarily know why or have the skills yet to want to go into acting, we it is a very visceral experience, and we all watch TV. It doesn't matter if it's a soap or if it's theatre or if it's an Oscar-nominated film or... You know, we will find stuff where we can see, like, we're on this funny planet and life is hard and weird. And, like, sometimes we see a piece of film or TV or theatre that moves us in some way. And we think, I want to do that. It, 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 you know, and I, so I think that's I think that's another reason why people go into it. And they mm-hmm. don't necessarily know why. But there's something miraculous, these gods on, on screen who can make you, who can reflect the way that you feel and can make you feel th- you know things your yourself and i think that maybe we don't you know that's quite a powerful thing sure sure was there a specific incident that you can recall where that happened to you when you were like not sure and you, you watched something or um saw something in theater where you're like yeah this is kind of sat with me 
even at a very young age? I mean, I grew up going to the National and like the Royal Court and the Don Mar and stuff. I mean, I've always loved like Sam Mendes' work. I mean, especially his theatre stuff. It's just the Bridge Project was pretty special. Um, and but even now, like you know, I don't know. You saw the Doctor p- that Rob Ike directed. You know, there are some of these moments that you just all of the the crap of of like you know auditions or like the whole kind of the the process behind all this stuff melts away when you go and see something that really like tells you something about the world and helps you process something. So I think I think those those reminders are are really important of like why <laughs> why we do this. Mm. Is it uh, is directing something and writing something you'd like to do in the future? Def- definitely writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I've written stuff. I'm writing stuff. TV, uh, film, theatre. Well, I've got an idea that I have written as a TV pilot. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the best format for it. I'm about to get an exclusive here. <laughs> um, mm, so my, I've had interesting experiences on, on set. Who hasn't? Um, and I think that uh, I'd like to explore that. I think I'd like to explore that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what? It might be quite good as a novel because mm-hmm. then I can write it in full and it's out there. It can be as long as you want exactly. without the restrictions. Exactly. Because sometimes, you know, we there is so much TV being made, but you could always adapt a book and it's and then it's already in a form that people can read. Whereas I think I'm f- I don't like the idea of going to all this work, writing a treatment and a pilot for something that just sits around. Um, yeah, because you hear so many things that just are in that perpetual hell of never actually being made. Yeah. Um, what's it called? The, the blacklist? Or yeah, something? that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, and the amount of scripts, uh, I think I read Jennifer Lawrence said that some of the scripts she's read in there are beyond brilliant. Yeah. They're better than a lot of the movies yeah. that are made, but yeah. studios just aren't willing to pick them up because it's so radically different or it's uh, just too old or too mm. new or you can't get funding for it or whomever yeah yeah you know on that note i thought one of the i don't know b- what you think but one of the best movies i've seen recently was the two popes yeah i saw that excellent did you like it uh, yeah i did like it i thought it was pretty good quite an intimate quite an intimate story yeah it was um, so lacking in ego it was like and it was a story i didn't know about really obviously i know about the popes and seeing it but it was not wasn't that long you know ago about the, the popes, i yeah. know about the popes i mean i've heard them and, and yeah. what have you but um yeah i thought it was pretty good jonathan price Anthony Hall. we were talking about this on another podcast mm. about the casting yeah because yeah. we were talking about how um so the baftas have obviously started nominating casting directors for their work in casting and all that and we were talking Which about... Which is so amazingly important. I don't know why. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things that I didn't really know is kind of the lengths that some of them go to. And that's what I was asking, because we were talking about the two popes, because that was nominated for Nina Gold. And I said, well, surely kind of you've just picked two really good actors. Or they were on board before Nina Gold was on board. That's the problem, because people judge it on like the leads, and it's like it's not just about the leads. Because, mm. I mean, Anthony, I don't know, normally things will get financed because of what actor they have. So the casting director won't be on until you know it needs to be cast well so it needs they need to look at obviously a big broad you know spectrum of things that the you know the one the day players you know especially on a series or mm. or on a big film where it's got a lot of cast they need to take that into account as well well i was listening to jonathan price on a, another podcast actually recently and he was talking about how s- when is he because uh, he plays pope i haven't watched the movie pope benedict am i right or it's ratzinger and the new pope is called I'm going to have to look it up. Anyway, uh, he was told years ago when he was brought into... Oh, wait, hang on. The new Pope's called the Pope. That's his name. <laughs> That's it. They actually get rid of his birth certificate Lol. and just change yeah. it for that kind yeah. of thing. By deed poll. Um, and he was told when he was voted in that, oh, you look like uh, that he guy. He does really look like him. And but he's also a brilliant actor, so I think he, his face probably just like changes slightly. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I hear they that there's a part where they're speaking, talking about Abba in Italian. Or <coughs> Spanish? Or yeah, I think he plays like it on the piano, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's so good. And how, is it Super Trooper or something like that is his favourite song? I don't know. Um, but he's Pope Francis. John, John, John Nathan Price. Um, <laughs> and John Nathan Price. <laughs> <laughs> All of the syllables <laughs> there. Yeah. There. <laughs> you start, get a piano uh, in. John Nathan Price. <laughs> <laughs> singing Abba now. Um, yeah. But he was, uh, he was told years back they looked like him and oh should they ever do something it'd be good and he probably just 
palmed it off as oh that's interesting and then when they were casting for it it's like you look really like him and you're quite a good actor so when he was it. made pope he was like oh yeah yeah <laughs> job coming my way soon they just th- one day you see look, pope <laughs> francis looks a little bit different today and he's got a different accent anyway moving on um but yeah so that's why we were talking about uh how see, i'm doing the wrong we do the here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> trying, nothing trying to beat it um but that's why we were talking about it because obviously he was brought on uh, he looked immediately like him he was brought on probably very very near the beginning mm-hmm. why does that deserve to get nominated over something like someone give me an example it must be the hardest thing is to 19- judge 1917 though. Is yes that that's a great example but it must be the hardest thing george, george Mackay and then the other boy whose name i'm i can't i don't know that i'm using that as an example because he's a newcomer and he was absolutely amazing yeah. i think that's probably dean charles chapman he was in game of thrones before yeah. wasn't he? okay that's true yeah. yeah okay but still like it's a brilliant choice but he looks a bit like there's something sam mendes about him and i think that's why he was cast because it's his grand great grandfather's story is that true yeah it's based so on yeah, that so the so end so it it's says something like, like that, based that someone, on the stories yeah so someone can see that there's some trace of some familiarity there i mean that's just genius mm. i thought that was one of the greatest films ever made um, are there any movies that you've ever watched that you felt have kind of pushed you in a certain way or made you go, I want to I don't know, emulate that in my own performances or are you purely uh, new, this is all my own stuff, I don't take or steal anything? Or Well, of course, we all kind of were influenced by everything. Mm. I mean, trying to think of things that have influenced me now is a bit, um, you know, it's like you go blank when you try and think of stuff. Mm. I mean... I'm more and more drawn to doing like comedy and theatre, and I mean it's even stuff like some like it hot. There's something so perfect and beautiful and funny and light about it, and it's so sophisticated, and yet it seems so easy. Mm. I think I try and remember that when I go up for comedy parts, because um yeah. What kind of comedy do you enjoy doing? Well, the two, the the two plays that I'm recently one was called French Without Tears at the Orange Tree that's a Rattigan and then the other one is a play at the Park Theatre with Janie D uh, play by Torben Betts directed by Alistair Watley and one is a a tried and tested kind of English comedy and the other one was a new play so different experiences Um, I think what's fun about doing a new play is that you get to you get it's on it's well first of all the playwright is alive which is um, which is which is so shit because they get them no stuff. shit because they get oh. to like argue oh, with you okay, when they're yeah. dead. You know you can just do what you want. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's great because because you can like change lines or uh, collaborate in in a way, and they're there to answer your questions. Um, it's like you know why is they why is my character doing this or what do they eat for breakfast? And they're like stop asking questions. Um, so yeah, I mean. New new comedy is very different from like old comedy, and um, but you know it's it's a more collaborative experience. Okay, um, I don't know. What I'm thinking yeah, loads about yeah. that. Yeah, I'm just, I'm I'm just, if I'm I was listening to the podcast, to I'd be like, wow, yeah, let me think about that. Uh, I'm just trying to think how to. Okay, so f- for example, we did this play at the park, right? And when was this? This is uh the summer of 2018. Um. Actually, both the park and the Orange Street are amazing, <laughs> amazing because they're small spaces. So yeah. you, you, you're so, you're so. N- are you have you done a play? No, but I've been there. I've done it there. Yeah. I've been there. I saw something there not long ago, and it was like, like really up close. You really felt like really you were up close. There. Yeah. Summer 2018 was a hot one. It was. R- it was boiling. Yeah. Right. What is this? Like Michael Fisher? There will not be a storm tonight. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but but, but it, 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 was it not just a ridiculously it was, hot but summer? The, that but year? the play was uh, was about. The, it was about a, t- a television chef, a kind of Nigella Lawson type, played by Janie. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, at the beginning of the play, everyone's kind of keeping their middle class, like anger, like together. And then when the family kind of reunite um, and some, you know, the, the, the wine starts flowing, everyone falls apart. So the, it was meant to be a hot, it was the, the setting was the summer mm-hmm. and it was meant to be hot mm-hmm. and it, there's a storm that breaks. So the heat on, it, it all worked. It all worked with it. But I... But I had to start the play wearing a chef's hat and doing a Swedish accent, <laughs> which was quite ri- ridiculous because I had to be, I had to list this um, dish called Jansson's Temptation. 
and they had to um, explain what it was and uh, the strubers and yeah. the, the cream. And um, yeah, it was it's quite intense when you've got people in the front row right next to you and you're being completely stupid. <laughs> but it was uh, <laughs> it was great fun. Um, but the or- but but at the orange tree, um, I had to sit. I had to. There was a stool that I had to pick up or something. And this is what's kind of charming about being in such a small space is that the front row of the audience. I think they felt like they were in the living room of the set because. A woman had her feet up on the stool. Okay. And you just find yourself at one point. <laughs> I just found myself like walking towards an it. Being like an audience oh, member. Oh, right. Yeah, being like... I was like, I what's the problem really with that? But now <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, just being thinking like, I really hope that they move it. And also my character was such a minxy v- like kind of vamp. And I remember saying something like... Um, um, oh, no, I'm, I'm really not. I'm really not such a, a bad a bad woman like you know please forgive me or like you know whatever and 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 this uh, the audience member piped up yes you are or like you a know she's like not a nice up. girl it's suddenly a panto yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly but that's kind of amazing because then they're kind of getting into it you know did you find yourself kind of um not egging it on but kind of rolling with it at that moment and uh no you just ignore it and carry on yeah like a complete professional or like <laughs> ian hart who um jumped out the audience and hart. took uh took the phone off didn't he he Someone did at, was it i national? heard that i yeah. heard that i kind of don't blame him yeah there have been a few so Orlando bloom and james mcavoy are both quite famous for doing that yeah. in recent years really Hugh yeah. did it in um a steady rain i don't blame With him. daniel craig yeah, yeah. that's right but they know that they riffed on it though didn't they I, I remember seeing the video but he, the guy had done it a lot it's like a lot of the time this stuff is publicized and it's like if you're in if you're in it and then you know it happens several times it's like the whole christian bale thing when he did his rant it's like that's the second time that it happened and I'm not condoning what um what he said and everything, but you know if you're in a really hyped up state and you just lose it, I can kind of sympathise with it or empathise with it. Oh, Have you ever um had any really on bad on stage experiences? Not bad, but like you've corpsed or you just can't remember or you've been thrown. Um, oof. Or even on on set, where you've just like lost it where you've just like laughed or you just couldn't get it together because of something hilarious happening i mean i mentioned i mean they say don't work with children or animals i've worked with both and i actually think they're both are pretty fun because they're a bit a little bit unpredictable mm-hmm. and sometimes that makes you just think on your feet um being bitten by a falcon during a scene is an interesting experience really all those falconry lessons obviously all those falconry lessons, mm-hmm. yeah. nailing them yeah yeah uh, the the, the Take that star off spotlight now <laughs> 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 um but yeah i mean these things, horse riding and falconry and like w- walking with a very long dress and oh let's add some dogs into the scene and like let's walk here and there and let's all get it done in five minutes. Things often take longer than you'd expect. Um, it was actually the best day, but you know it. it I remember it nibbled my finger. It was a sharp. It was a sharp. It was a sharp. You know, nothing happened, but you kind of just you just roll with it. You kind of get on with it, really. Mm. Um, getting up onto side saddle. That's interesting. It's harder than it looks. In in full dress, I in imagine. In full dress. You know, actually walking, I had all my costumes made for me, tailor-made for my body, which is amazing, obviously. But um, Do you get to keep any of them? Um, no, they they go into storage because if we you know get another season, of then, course. Yes. then you use them again. Mm. Um, if not, um, <laughs> fancy dress. Hook me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll let you know if yeah, you want to no, wear no, some of my dresses. You, you lit up like a Christmas tree. I was about to say. No. Um but yeah, no walking. <laughs> the way All choices in your audition there. Yeah. <laughs> but this, I mean, this kind of weird technical stuff. I walked. I got married in Ely Cathedral on the Royals. I mean, how am I going to top that in real life, right? Um, where they shoot the crown. It's, th- it's stunning. Mm-hmm. But weirdly, you know, walking in a long dress and not tripping up over your own feet is was was hard. But you know, what were we talking about? I've lost. I've lost all all comprehension. What? How far? Oh, difficult moments on set yeah. and stuff and theatre and TV. Oh, it's gone so quick. It has, yeah. I mean, no. Let's carry on. Let's carry on. We've got it till seven. Let's go for another six or seven minutes. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Whatever. Sorry, Genevieve. Please yeah, continue. Um, yeah. I mean, you were talking about side saddles just before. Like, yeah. was it one of those that like take twenty three? Genevieve's fallen off the side of the horse, kind of thing, or was it a? I think, no. We we kind of we kind of managed it, but mm. m- I had um, a lovely actor called Artie who he was helping me up um, 
I remember actually, that's the other thing about acting. I, you you know what it's like, you become like best friends of people quite quickly. Mm-hmm. And we, and the first time I met him, we were, we were sharing a car to go and do practice for the side saddle. And I remember it was really cold in park and I had this big kind of like scarf, kind of old tartan scarf. And the first thing he said to me was like, oh, is that your horse blanket? And I was like, I know I'm going to be best friends with this person. And he helped me up. You know, he kind of put his hands out and, and you have to step into it and you feel terrible doing it. But um, but 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 no, we we we, we managed it together. So it was great. Are there anything, are there any roles that you'd like to do but don't tend not to get seen for? Like any types of roles? Yes, except that they're fulfilled in the voiceover dramas that I do. Okay. Like, I, I'd i say a piece of advice, because you were talking earlier about um, like what advice would you give people? And I think that whether it's acting or whether it's in life, like when you're in your mid-20s and you're kind of coming out of your mid-20s, you, you start to realise like, don't try and be what you think other people want you to be. Do what you want to do and, and what's right for you. Because if you do that, then you'll probably find your thing. And I remember being told, oh, you'll never do accents for like commercial work because they'll always use someone who is like n- from that mm. native like country. And yeah, that's true, of course, if you're, you know, for, for some stuff. But I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to record it anyway. And now I just do loads of like audio dramas where I get to play like Russians and Germans and stuff for like Big Finish mm-hmm. and Audible and things like that and different voices. And I love that. I think it's so liberating because I c- I'm, I've just done this Audible drama called The Warringham Chronicles. Miriam Margulies is the narrator. Mm-hmm. Um, she's extraordinary. Um, and and I, I, I was playing this you know, lovely romantic heroine. And then I also get to play like Northamptonshire landlady, you know, who's kind of like Northern, like <gasps> crony and like, you know, a b- bit disgusting and a bit, you know, beery. And, and that's th- something you probably wouldn't play on screen. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe, you know, you know. Well, you know, time will tell. Know, but, uh, but you can, you know, I get to do, I get to scratch certain itches that, you know, I that character parts, you know, that's fun. Um, yeah. And where can we hear these? The Warringham Chronicles has just dropped on Audible. I'm in volume three mm-hmm. but the first volume has come out mm-hmm. and how long does it take to produce something like that just for your part that is an epic it's the biggest audio drama that audible have ever produced the oh cast really? the cast is 50 and wow. everyone's like playing multiple roles um it's huge yeah it's, it's yeah it's a lot i mean the turnaround i don't know they've been working on it for a long time but the your part how long were you there doing that for or parts um or is it we something did. spread over a long time? You keep no, going back and forward. Or? I can't remember how many days exactly, but it was a l- it was a lot of material mm. and a very yeah, it was very. And do you intense. obviously don't have to learn it as such? Obviously, you get familiar with it, but you can you, you can have the lines there. Yeah, you don't have to learn it. I think, I think what I've learned though is that if you if you're doing voiceover work, and you definitely practice it out loud, mm-hmm. to get every to know, to know the placement of every word. It's like anything, right? If you go over it a little bit, then you can kind of forget about it. Hmm. Solid. <laughs> okay. Well, um, one of the final questions we ask mm-hmm. before we finish up the podcast: um, Are there any movies that you are ashamed that you haven't seen? We talked earlier about people who hadn't seen like Stanley Kubrick movies or anything. But is there anything that you know you always kind of pie off and you go, "Oh yeah, yeah, no, I've seen that movie," but you know, if they ask you any questions, you're completely stuck in the mud. Well, when I did Nightfall, we went the read through. And everyone was kind of nervous because people are nervous at read-throughs. And um, this this man called Mark was sitting next to me. <laughs> we had a great time. We were vibing. He's a yeah, lovely, is vibing. lovely man. LA. Vibing, yeah. That's really something that... There's a kind of social media word or something that kind of creeps into like common parlance. And it's like, just no, stop. Stop. Um, and, you know, I actually... I'm ashamed to say it. I haven't seen Star Wars, which was great. Cause Any I'm of them? No, none of them. And the reason why is because I, it's so amazing and it's so important that I need to start from the beginning mm-hmm. and I can't just drop into it at some point. So I need to set aside a weekend to watch it properly. You did Margot Robbie he hasn't seen it. You did know that he was Luke Skywalker and all that. Yeah, I, I I did, but I I didn't I didn't, and you know he's so respected, but I wasn't quite so, f- I wasn't so starstruck or fangirling like I think other, <laughs> other butch men were around the room. <laughs> He does quite a lot of voiceover himself. He doesn't is. He, m- he is the I think king he's the best of Joker. He's the king of of, of voiceovers. Mm. Yeah. Did it, do you get lots of experience from him? Did you ask him like, or did he? Was he one of these people who would 
constantly be doing voices or characters on set? Or? Well, that's the, fu- the funny thing is that we sat down for this read through and uh, he started, you know, when he started speaking, I, I thought that is, wow, this, this, this is one of the best British accents I've ever heard. I remember thinking, wow, it was super impressive. Mm. So the entire Star Wars trilogy is your answer to that one. Oh, yeah. trilogy? N- well, nine? What are, what was more than that now, isn't Three trilogies. Just to clarify, like I, th- I thought he, he could be British. Yeah. It was so it yeah. was so on point. Yeah, no, he's done a lot of Batman. He did a lot of Batman. He was a Joker for years. He was the he? Joker. He's done hundreds of video games. Yeah, and um, yeah. I think he's a comic book writer as well, isn't he? I don't know about that. If uh, he isn't, we'll cut that out. I could just be making that up. This whole podcast is going to be cut out, isn't it? <laughs> 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 the lies that we've told on it. <laughs> It's been a brilliant co- podcast, though. And we have Genevieve. to thank you for coming on. Thank it's you so pleasure. much. It's thank been really, really me. brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. All right. Have a great time. Bye.